message this morning, and if you're listening on mygladtidings.org, this message for you also too. I'm thankful today that he gave me this today, and a uh, and very simple message, a very simple but powerful message that he gave me to give to you, and if you're looking today on mygladtidings.org, you're streaming this, uh, this is for you, our internet family, and I want you to be encouraged also. Church, I want you to know that Jesus' miracles are still prevailing. Some people will contradict and say that the Lord did miracles back then, but he's done thousands of miracles since then. And he's continually to do it. And I want you to know that he is still the miracle-working God. And there's nothing that the enemy can say or do to distract that. He may try to play with your mind. That's his playground. But he's the one, but he knows. He knows deep down inside. One of these days, that miracle-working God is going to put him where he belongs. It's just a matter of time. But I want you to know today that he is a miracle-working God. Today I want to preach to you today, his wine never runs out. His wine never runs out. And before I go to the scripture, I want to give you this background. We're going to go to the scripture. We're going to be in John chapter 2, 1 through 11. And this is about the first miracle of the Lord. The first miracle of God, how when he first really, really came on the scene as the man, 30 years old, he came in the scene and he's being manifested, his, his, his spirit is being manifested by God in this time. This is his first miracle. Again, we're going to be in John chapter 2, 1 through 11. And let me tell you about this background. The first miracle of the Lord took place in a town of Cana, Galilee. The event was a wedding. I'm going to set this stage for you. It was a modest and quiet little town that lay outside of Nazareth. Cana had no social prominence in in their day. In fact, biblical scholars took almost 1,800 years before they could figure out just where this town was. Mary and the mother of Jesus, Mary the mother of Jesus and Jesus and disciples all had been invited to this wedding. Because social standing was so important in the Jewish culture at this time. And we assume that this was a peasant type of wedding. Otherwise, Mary being a peasant would have never been invited. So it's interesting to note this, that that Jesus' ministry, like his birth, began in a small, unimportant town to common everyday people. We know that weddings are big deals in our culture. But weddings were and are and and, and very big deal in the Jewish culture. They were very big deals big deals then and they are now and there is a certain protocol that is to be followed if the bride was a virgin the wedding occurred on Wednesday if the bride was a widow it would be on a Thursday see a wedding ceremony would take place late in the evening after a time of feasting the father of the bride would take his daughter on his arm and the wedding party would follow behind them. They would stroll through the streets of the village so that everyone could come out and congratulate the bride. Finally, the wedding party would arrive at the home of the groom. The wedding actually took place in the front door of the groom's home. It was no short ceremony either. And the partying lasts for days. It was a time of great celebration. And so after the wedding ceremony, 
the bride and groom will walk through the streets accompanied by flaming torches. And their attendants walk with them keeping a canopy over their heads. I want you to picture this. The wedding party always took the longest route through the village so that as many people as possible could come and wish them well. And there was no such thing as a honeymoon. No, it wasn't. No, the couple kept open house for a week. They were treated like royalty. They dressed in fancy clothes and many times actually wore crowns on their heads. So whatever desire they spoke for, they received. Their word was law. The groom's family was expected to provide all the refreshments for this week of events and celebrations. And this is where we're going to pick up this scripture. We're going to read John 2, 1 through 11. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to them, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone. According to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that, had, that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And now the guests have well drunk. Then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This is the beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. And manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Dear Jesus, we honor you and thank you. Thank you for this time, and thank you for your worship. Thank you for everything you've done for us today. I pray that this message will encourage everyone here and those who may be watching. Lord, I thank you that your wine never runs dry. And we thank you, Father, because you are a great God. I don't preach in my own strength, but I preach in yours, Father. And I thank you for this time. I honor you and thank you for blessing us with the scripture. May you bless this scripture honor you and give you praise. Anoint me, Lord, as I preach, and anoint your people as they listen, as we give you thanks. Amen? Amen. So here's the moment. Here's the moment here. The host of the wedding discovers that they are running out of wine. They had more guests than they anticipated on having. And it would have been improper in the culture of the Jewish culture to have, and it's time to not have wine for everyone. Jews did not get drunk at these celebrations because drunkenness was considered a disgrace and very, very disrespectful to the married couple and to the event itself. But the host could have actually been sued for a breach of hospitality to his guests if there was not enough wine. Some people didn't know that, but he could have. Evidently, they did not have the money to go and purchase more wine. So we can assume that Jesus' mother was a close friend of the groom's mother, and she heard about the problem. Who knows if these families were close friends or not? It's highly possible that Jesus may have been a close friend of the groom himself. So Jesus' mother comes to Jesus and says, Son, we, we, we've got a problem here. 
We, we need your help. The groom's family is running out of wine. And, and, and the fact that Mary came to Jesus with such a problem is a reminder that, that, that Jesus is concerned with the everyday things in life that we face. He is concerned then and he is concerned now for the problems we face. Praise Jesus for that. And Jesus said in verse 4, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, now Jesus answers this mother in what seems to be an insensitive and unkind way. Now, if I know some of you, uh, I wouldn't go to my mama, mother and say woman. I might not have some of my teeth left. Anybody ever went to their mother and said, hey, woman? No, no. Some of you would not be here sitting this day here. But he, he said woman. But the thing was, in Jesus' way, he was not being disrespectful or unkind to his mother. He would, he would never do that. He was just simply already focusing on his life ministry and had begun to detach himself or take himself away from his family. There was no disrespect. John calls this miracle, his first miracle, a sign. Signs are, are usually placed in, 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 in places to give us information or point us in the right direction. The miracles of Christ were always meant to reveal to us the glory of God. It was a sign and point us to who he truly is. And I want you to be encouraged by this sign today and what it means to us. Notice that first of all, these signs inform us that the wine can run out. See, Mary realizes the seriousness of the issue. You can hear it in the words when she said, they have no wine. To the Jewish people, wine symbolized joy. At the wedding in Cana, their joy had run out. It's a reminder of the emptiness of our life without Christ. See, this announcement or declaration by the mother of Jesus goes beyond liquid refreshment at a wedding. It is a symbolic thing in our lives. It's symbolic of our lives. It is a scary thing when the wine runs out. And then there are times when the, when the, when the wine runs out, the joy is dry. You know what? There are people who are ending it all, who are committing suicide today, who are taking their own lives and throwing in the towel of their lives, even, even, even as we speak now, because the joy is dry. Families that were once, that once began with exuberant joy are now ending the pain in pain of divorce. Why? Because there is no more joy in the relationship. There are those who have not went to those extremes, but you know what? They are not living life. They're just enduring life. They are just existing. They float and drift from one day to the next. But let me tell you this. You and I have no resources available within ourselves to replace joy. Only new wine can come from Jesus Christ, our great Savior. Who knows that today? He knows that when we run out of wine. And then this sign teaches us that when the wine runs out, Jesus can turn the water into wine. Mary came to Jesus and, and told him the problem that they were facing. And I can just imagine her telling the groom's mother, you, you just hold on a minute. I know just what to do in this situation. She came to Jesus and told him, and I love her instructions to the servants in verse 5. She says, 
Whatever he says to do to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. Just do it. Folks, whatever he says to you, do it. Jesus took those six water pots of stone that were filled with water for hand washing. And when the guests arrived, someone would pour some of the water over their hands in a symbolic purification. To eat with unwashed hands would have been a violation or disrespect of the Jewish tradition. So Jesus took this water and made approximately 180 gallons of wine. What a wedding gift. See, it's interesting to note that Jesus took the water for purification and used it for the first miracle. The water in those pots were merely for an outside, outside or external cleansing. Jesus' ministry over the next three years would teach people about an inner cleansing. So if we took the first miracle of Jesus, we see the truth. See, see, Jesus is not just a giver of joy. I want to give you this today. He's not just a giver of joy. He's the giver of abundant joy. Someone say abundant. And I, 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 and I prayed when I was getting this message together. And he says to me, James, I'm an abundant giver of joy. He, only, he not only met their immediate need, but he gave them an abundance. He did not just make some ordinary wine. No, no, no. The wine that he produced was better than that which they had started the celebration with. How many know that God can give you better? Jesus didn't just doctor the water to that it tasted like wine. No, no, the water in those pots was transformed into the finest wine the people had ever tasted. In fact, this was the greatest and finest wine ever created for anyone in the, to taste in the history of man. Can you imagine Jesus making some wine himself? What do you think that may have tasted like? Those folks were happy. I want you to think about that. The truth of this for, for us is this. Jesus is not going to just doctor up our lives a little bit. He is not going to just put a band-aid on our knees. No, he wants to transform your life just like he transformed that water into new and greater wine. Our lives will take on a new nature, a new character, and a new and greater quality. You know, as someone once said, don't focus on the stone water part, on, on, the stone, on the stone water pots and miss the whole point. Jesus is about transformation. He turned water into wine. He turns frowns into smiles. He, he, he turns cries and sobs of fear into songs of hope. He turns dry deserts and flourish into flourishing gardens. He turns... Deep sorrow into abundant joy. He turns sin into his marvelous grace. He turns death into everlasting life. You know what? Jesus is all about transforming power. That's what he's all about. And changing people. And that's what it's all about. And that's what he is all about. And then this miracle, this sign teaches us that Jesus offers an abundance of noon wine at the end. You know, sometimes it's hard for us to understand God not only meeting our supplications and needs, but providing us with an abundance. I want to give this to someone today. That's why I want to give you let you know that that's the story of grace. Someone say grace. There is no measure to grace. 
There will always be enough grace to meet our needs forever. And his marvelous grace never runs dry. That's the story of God's love, folks. There's, there's nothing that you can do that will cause God to reduce or lessen his love for you. And nothing can keep us away from that powerful love of God. Romans 8, 38 and 39. And we know this scripture. For I am persuaded, Paul says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creative thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Understand this standard or the value of God. God is not just a God of what we need or the the, the God of the required. He is the God of the abundance. Malachi 3 and 10 says this. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try and try me now. In this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Let me give you this amplified version of it. He says, bring all the tithes, the tenth, into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you so great a blessing until there is no more room to receive it. Not just enough, but in abundance. Look at creation. We have not seen all the great majestic mountains the Lord has created. No. No amount of people has ever seen them the most of the earth the Lord has has ever created. We have not seen all the thousands and thousands of miles of beautiful oceans and seas. There are hundreds of beautiful islands around the world that are uncharted that the Lord has created. There are flowers and flowering plants around the world that man has started to discover but will not discover all of them. Have you seen a field of wildflowers? Not just enough, but more than enough that can fill your vases in your home. They're they're, they're, they're beautiful fish in the sea that that man has started to discover, but will not discover all the species. It's an overabundance. The Lord didn't give us just enough beauty. (laughs) It's all around. And and speaking of the seashore, have you ever been to the seashore and looked out over the ocean? Anybody ever been to the seashore, looked out over the ocean? There is far more beauty than our eyes can understand. This is the picture of grace. Mm. Come on, someone say grace. (sighs) That's the picture of grace. God has always given more than you will ever need. So as we look at this wedding here, the wine is poured out at the wedding. And and all the people who are present rejoice in the richness and the goodness of this new wine. This was completely against custom. The best wine was always offered first. Now let me go back to John 2 and 10. It says this, and he said, Every man at the beginning sets off the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. Isn't that just like our Lord? The best always comes at the end. The grace we once tasted carefully and watchfully, we now Drink freely. Jesus has poured out in us the richness of his love and forgiveness, and he does it in a.
abundance. He's abundant in grace. He's abundant in his love. And thank you, Jesus. You are abundant in your forgiveness. I asked him this morning, Lord, if I've done anything that wasn't right in your sight, please forgive me. And when I told him that, I asked him last, I said, Lord, if you please forgive me. I know then I got a feeling. I said, Lord, you forgive me. And I know he forgave me and he forgot it. You know what? He's a, hey, he has enough grace to save you no matter what you've done in your life. There are no excuses. He has an overabundance of grace. Even if you're saved and you think you've done something wrong, he will forgive you. If you backslid and, 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 and fell off for time, he will accept you back with open arms. He has abundant grace and mercy to do this. There's no excuses. Our Lord is among each of us every day. I thank you, God, and pouring out his rich wine that never runs dry. The rich wine of his grace and his mercy. And there's more than enough for everyone who joins in and partakes of it. It never runs out. There's no excuses. Our God's forgiveness is everlasting and eternal. His grace is overabundant. His love for us surpasses everything. It is sovereign over every ill and every sickness and every disease and every sin. His love and mercy compasses it all. He is abundant in his grace. Hallelujah. Who can think in this house? If you're in this house, and I want you to think now, and if you're watching, think now. Think back. How many of you know that it was grace that saved you? Come on, how many know it was grace that saved you? I know some people here today should have been dead today. But you know, by God's grace and mercy, we are here. Someone say, I'm still here. Say it again, I'm still here. We are still here, folks, by his grace and mercy. Hallelujah. And if you're watching today or you may be in this house as I end this message, What do you do when the wine runs out? Mary showed us by example. She she told the servants that if they would just do what Jesus commanded, they would see a miracle. Again, she says to them, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, Do it. A miracle that not only met their immediate need, but a miracle of abundance. Let me ask you something. Has your joy ran out today? And I thank God for blessing us to pray earlier today. But for you who are watching today and say still somebody maybe in the house, he wants to transform you. He says today, bring your need to him. He has more than enough. Some of you may be watching, may not have the joy of Jesus in your life today. Bible tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Do you need that joy today? If you're in the house, how many know that he can make the difference in your life? He can give you a better lease on life. He can give you a new way, new walk, new talk. In fact, he will give you eternal life through him. And I'm so grateful that his grace and mercy abounds. 
He is willing to come into your heart if you're willing to accept him. Salvation is free. Real unspeakable joy cannot be found in man, in man's devices. Cannot be found in any type of drug. Cannot be found in vapors or whatever you have. No liquor, no type of thing. Those are short-lived. Our God is eternal. How many know that today? Let him give you the joy that you have been yearning for. Now I say this, why don't you meet him now? Because you don't want to meet him later. The Lord gave an overabundance of wine in that wedding. The greatest wine ever made by any being of anywhere. He didn't just do it because of necessity. He did it out of love. And he gives us grace and mercy out of love. So much of it, he can have it running out of our ears if we need it to. So grateful that the Lord is always looking out after us. When we prayed this morning, he was looking out after you. And I'm so glad he did that. But if you're watching today and you're not saved and you need joy in your heart today, it's time to let the Lord into your life. Whether well, it's one or a thousand, I want to pray for you. If you're in the house today, you know Jesus Christ. Lift those hands high and proud. We today, and thank you that put your hands down. Thank you that. I thank the Lord today that he's blessed his church and wants us to be saved. But you may be watching, may need Christ Jesus in your life today. And we want to pray for you. You need the joy of the Lord in your heart. You need it today. And I want you to know that he is able to give you an abundance of joy for the rest of your life. Repeat after me here and let's agree with those who need to be saved today need joy. Dear Jesus, here I am. I want to give my life to you. You know what I've done. You know what I need. I am at your service. I want you to save me. Please save me. Take my life. Take my heart. Take my body. Take my mind. Take my soul. Everything belongs to you. And I give it to you today. I yield to you. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my shame. Make me a new creature. Make me a new servant. Give me a new lease on life. I want my joy back, Father. Give me your joy and your peace by saving me. Again, Father, I thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Now, Lord, I thank you for giving me a new life and a new way to live. Keep my heart saved and keep my soul. Thank you. For saving me. Amen. 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 Give God a hand of praise this morning. Hallelujah.